So first, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers uh, of this meeting for the kind invitation to deliver the Paul Armstrong Lecture. Uh, this is both a pleasure as well as an honor for me. I met Paul more than uh, 40 years ago at an annual meeting of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. I believe it was about 1972, so a while back. We both had uh, just completed our training uh, and were beginning our academic careers. He was at Queen's and I was at Dalhousie. We had a lot in common. We were both cardiologists, uh, and we'd done a lot of our uh, training in the UK and in the US. We became friends, and over the years we've had a lot of interactions. I had many opportunities to work with Paul and witness his leadership capabilities, his drive, and also to help celebrate some of his accomplishments. I also had the opportunity to work with Paul and others preparing for the establishment of this organization as just been referred to by Carol. His vision, his energy, and I would say particularly his persistence were essential to the success that's been achieved. I'm pleased, very pleased, that CAHS has chosen to honor Paul with this annual lecture. For a number of years after we had both moved to Alberta, Paul and his wife Bev and my wife Sheila and I spent uh, time annually uh, hiking in the beautiful Rocky Mountains. We had a lot of fun, had great exercise, and experienced some wonderful views. But it was this view of Paul that I will remember most. I became very familiar with watching his back disappear up the mountain and I believe he was just demonstrating his leadership. I've, I've chosen today to speak about the academy and the healthcare system. After I submitted the title, I actually worried that I might have caused confusion in people's mind by referring to the academy. The academy that I am speaking of, of course, is universities with health sciences faculties and not the Academy of Health Sciences. Although, uh, as I'll point out later, I think there maybe is a significant potential role for the Academy of Health Sciences in dealing with the problems, that some of the problems that I'm going to refer to uh, as I uh, talk to you this morning. My comments are not based on a comprehensive uh, review of the now substantial literature on this subject. Of course, I have reviewed some literature and the report particularly of the National Task Force on the Future of Canada's Academic Health Sciences Centers. However, what I'm going to say are really my reflections and, uh, and from almost 45 years now of academic life. My perspectives are influenced by experiences that I had as a junior clinician scientist, as a department and uh, division head in an academic, uh, with academic and clinical responsibilities, as a senior academic with major responsibilities for a faculty, and finally uh, with a role in governance of the healthcare system in Alberta. In addition, of course, I, I participated in a large number of departmental faculty and hospital reviews across the country, and these provided me with additional opportunities to compare and contrast uh, systems employed in different centers. The term that we commonly use in Canada to describe the relationship between the academy and the healthcare system is an academic health sciences center with a tripart mission of education, research, and advanced patient care is integrated. But there's no widely accepted definition of an academic health sciences center and the organization varies markedly between centers. Indeed, in the mid-1980s, Peter Drucker, uh, the renowned organizational guru, mused that the modern teaching hospital at that time was the most complex organization ever created. Whether that was true or not, it would be interesting to speculate now 
how he would uh, have described the modern academic health sciences center, which has increased tremendously in complexity. Although the complexities may not be immediately apparent to the casual observer, they are there and they're in the many competing priorities, the multiple funding streams upon which they depend, and the organizational disparities that exist. From an organizational perspective, a simple depiction of the healthcare system looks similar to many businesses. Consider it a company with three products, clinical care, education, and research. However, clinical care is the major product with lesser positions in education and research. Now compare this to the organizational chart of the academy. The business produces the same three health-related products, but with education and research being dominant, with clinical care a lower priority. In the business world, I suspect that it would not take long for a merger or acquisition to take place between these two enterprises, with the resulting company producing all three products and in quantity sufficient to meet the demand in the community. Moreover, the administration of this company would likely be a traditional one with a board, a CEO, and a number of vice presidents in the uh, major areas of responsibility. With such a merger, efficiencies would be realized, costs would be reduced, and, and at least uh, to the corporate level, there would be some, uh, the, the, each division would be accessible and would be transparent. But in Canada, such a merger between the academy and the healthcare system has not happened. It has happened in some other jurisdictions, which I'll refer to a bit later. In Canada, we have created the Academic Health Sciences Center with operations and governance primarily dependent upon affiliation agreements, which some would describe as an organization of unlinked partners. The term Academic Health Sciences Center has been used in Canada for almost six decades. However, in 1993, Arnold Neymar uh, defined it as is shown on this slide. Parenthetically, Canada is given credit in much of the international literature for developing this term. In the US, the terms used more often were Academic Medical Center or Academic Health Centers, and in the in Netherlands and in certain other European countries, they're usually referred to as university medical centers. In each instance, the term attempts to describe an organization created to integrate the functions of education, research, and patient care. The National Task Force on the Canada's uh, Academic Health Sciences Center provided an updated definition as shown on this slide. You will note that it is certainly not just an agreement between a teaching hospital and a faculty of medicine, but rather a complex set of relationships among educational and care facilities. It is this more complex organization that the National Task Force suggested needs to be and to function as a network rather than a center. In Canada, the evolution of the Academic Health Science Center has varied with each location. Indeed, it is frequently said that if you have seen one Academic Health Sciences Center, you have seen one Academic Health Sciences Center. <laughs> Originating in the traditional relationship between the teaching hospital with the Faculty of Medicine, it has evolved, influenced by increases in public support for health care, the massive growth in clinical research support, the changing educational needs of the learners, and the changing governance of the health care system. Certainly many changes occurred when a number of provinces chose to develop regionalized healthcare delivery models. The old affiliation agreements then were largely void and the academy found itself in a position of having considerably less influence in the delivery of care. 
Moreover, at least in Alberta, some new regional health authorities adopted the principle that they were only responsible for clinical care, which was to be of comparable quality in all the clinical sites. That is, no ivory tower of the major hospital, but all sites having sort of equal uh, uh, quality uh, that were under the control of the regional authority. And also that the health care system should not be responsible for costs involving education and research. It took some time for the con before the concept of partnership with the university was reestablished, and there became a new realization that education and research were essential to the future of the healthcare system, and that the care system had to be a prominent player. To understand the current organizations, it's necessary to be aware of how the structures have evolved, and I'd just like to consider some of the major players. The university is an autonomous institution which receives the majority of its funding from the Provincial Government Department of Advanced Education or some, some similar named department. Its mandate is education and increasingly in latter decades in research and innovation. It does not normally identify with the provision of service, at least until the administration deals with its health sciences faculties. Now these health science faculties include uh, uh, nursing and medicine and pharmacy and dentistry and rehabilitation, kinesiology, social work, physiotherapy, psychology, and even biomedical engineering. But it's the faculty of medicine with their large faculty numbers, uh, large research enterprise, and a large appetite for budget allocation that has caused uh, much consternation for many senior academic administrators, administrator, administrators. Today I will speak mostly about faculties of medicine uh, since it is what I know best, but this is not intended to diminish the important roles that these other disciplines play in the function of the university or of the healthcare system. Indeed, with a more distributed education and care delivery system today, it can be argued that these other disciplines have become ever more important at the, as the faculty of medicine role and influence has diminished. But tensions within the academy do continue. One Canadian university recently mused again about the problems of having full-time faculty members who are clinicians and engage in treating very ill patients. This creates huge risk for the academy while not contributing significantly to the overall missions of education and research. Tensions between uh, deans of medicine and senior university administration have been common and I guess inevitable and at times have been very pro problematic. Of course, there is the story of a university president who died and went to hell. Uh, a short time later, the devil informed her that she would now be president of the University of Hell. The president expect, expressed major joy at this news. She was delighted. But the devil quickly pointed out, saying, Madam President, you don't understand. This university has two medical schools. <laughs> So that was part of the hell for the university presence. Within the uh, faculties of medicine, the impressive increase in student numbers combined with the increased availability of research funds provided a significant opportunity to grow the faculty numbers during the late 60s, the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s. Many of these new faculty members were clinician scientists who were involved in clinical research, and, and, and of course, by definition, were also involved in patient care activities for which they were paid a fee for service. Some departments in the faculty realized that this ability to generate service income could be a, bar a barrier to incentivize research and education activity, and so developed the so-called practice plans whereby the clinical earnings of group members, usually a clinical department, were pooled. Each faculty member was paid an amount, then based on specialty, seniority, and performance, 
with the remainder utilized to enhance the education and research missions. These practice plans, of course, were administered by a separate member-led organizational structure, and therefore as these plans grew, the influence grew, and another source of potential conflict emerged, both for the department and for the healthcare system. Departments with successful practice plans were able to recruit, so became larger, did more research, frequently did more teaching, and thereby became more influential within the academy. It also caused concern within the healthcare system administration. Having to negotiate with the head of a practice plan, in addition to everybody else, just added another tier of potential conflict and made it more difficult to recruit individuals to other disciplines with perhaps much greater need. This was in addition to the fact that the academic clinicians used precious hospital space and resources to produce the fee-for-service income, which allowed the departments the autonomy to recruit new faculty and develop new programs, which added yet more costs to the hospital budgets. In addition, the healthcare system was generally not happy with healthcare dollars being used for research and education despite the benefit to the academic mission. Even with all these concerns, or at the, in my view, the overall effect of practice plans has probably been positive. I was always impressed that in speaking with heads of departments, that heads of large departments without such a plan felt that they had to develop one if they were going to be uh, successful or even survive. However, departments with one, particularly the larger ones, complained that the practice plan was their greatest challenge. From personal perspective, my major experience with the practice plan was one of relative disappointment. Despite what was said, the plan did value clinical activity more than research or education roles and therefore could serve as a relative disincentive for academic activity. In the past couple of decades, practice plans have become less of an issue in Canada, although they continue to exist and exert their influence in some centers. But we've seen a steady increase in the development of so-called alternative uh, funding or, or relationship plans, whereby, sorry, I should have advanced here. Um, Um, sorry about that. Um, in these plans, uh, an envelope of funding is provided by government to compensate academic clinicians for their clinical, education, and research activities as a total package. The physicians no longer collect fee-for-service billings. University salary and other administrative stipends get added to the ARP pool for distribution. This has been a great benefit to the faculties of medicine, but perhaps less so for the healthcare system, where there is concern expressed that increased academic activity has been at the expense of decreased clinical care. From the perspective of the so-called teaching hospitals, there are other problems which are no less challenging. In the 80s and 90s, administrators of teaching hospitals were reasonably happy with the arrangements with the university. The hospital had prestige for being the university or teaching hospital, and because of special services provided by these institutions, they were well placed for budget negotiations to procure larger and larger portions of the healthcare budget. Moreover, the presence of academic clinicians, the residents, and even the students provided workforce for the hospital, which was not directly on their payroll. However, there were tensions. From the perspective of some hospital administrators, the university had too much influence on who was recruited and what their activities would be. Moreover, it was the university that provided the sought-after academic appointment with the annual evaluation and promotions. The university also often seemed to garner the public recognition for newsworthy events in education and research, but even for new clinical programs. Of course, in some centers, 
the opposite concerns were expressed as the teaching hospitals uh, were occasionally receiving credit for university-based research advances. Adding to this potential for conflict is the competition for donor funds that always exists between these two organizations. Depending on the personalities of the hospital CEO and the medical dean, things either worked well or stalled hopelessly in the discussion stage. But things then became more complicated when social pressures mounted on the universities to provide more meaningful clinical exposure to the students. Being part of a team caring for transplant patients was exciting, but the students were mere observers and were not being exposed to many of the things that they would encounter routinely in their future practices. This has been largely dealt with by increasing the breadth of the Academic Health Science Center to include community hospital as teaching sites and more recently long-term care facilities, rehabilitation facilities, and even community practices. This increased complexity is certainly a justification for the proposed name change uh, to academic health sciences networks. These changes have had a major impact on the tertiary care institutions that had depended on these students and residents for service activity. This has resulted in the need to hire personnel to provide in-hospital after-hour patient care, which includes physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and even the development of a new occupational group called hospitalists. Not only has this increased the budget requirements for the healthcare system, but has decreased the satisfaction for the academic faculty who actually enjoy the interaction with learners in the clinical environment. For clinical departments, the challenges to make on-call schedules work have been significant and has led to areas of conflict with the academic clinicians who have perceived more pressure to provide more clinical service. At this time in Canada, we have 17 more or less uh, academic health sciences centers. Definitions again are vague and not consistent. Each has different configurations, agreements, funding arrangements, and problems. No one seems particularly happy with the current situation, and there are frequent calls for the academic health science centers to evolve or lose their status. The criticisms come from many sources. Government is unhappy with the added costs incurred in the teaching environment, and particularly in the tertiary care hospitals. The organizations lack transparency, and accountability pathways are not always evident. We continue with the problems that problem that many of the clinical decisions and the drivers of costs are being made by persons who are not employees of the healthcare system and certainly not of the healthcare institutions involved in the Academic Health Sciences Center. The potential for conflict is ever present and serious issues frequently go to the back burner because consensus cannot be developed. So what can be done? From an organizational theory viewpoint, the answer would seem to be to create a new structure with designated funding and a single administration with the authority to make the system work. Many thoughtful people have considered this issue and decided that this is very unlikely to happen in Canada given our history and the organization of our education and health systems. In this regard, there are lessons from other countries. In the USA, the academic health science centers have developed differently. From 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid were in initiated, the universities recognized the enormous potential for revenue generation from clinical activity. Some universities even responded by purchasing hospitals and by developing extensive referral networks, and all of them significantly increased their clinical faculty. For some, the organizational structure became that of business model. Uh, roughly 25% of the 126 academic centers in, in the U.S. developed a model of one CEO for both clinical care and the academic matters. 
Interestingly, though, this has not been the successful model that might be expected, and for reasons that are not uh, totally clear. Even the Mayo Clinic, which is perhaps the most integrated and successful academic health science center in the U.S., having three clinical campuses and a medical school on two sites, has a CEO for the clinical operations and a dean for the medical school. Perhaps the fact that both answer to the Board of Governors of the Mayo Foundation allows for the singularity of purpose that the clinic usually displays. Other experiments, such as a single academic and clinical leader at the University of Pennsylvania, have failed, and the merger between Stanford and the University of California failed in less than one year. Some academic health science centers, such as the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard University, continue to be successful by many measures, despite ongoing tensions between administrations of the two organizations. The current drivers for change in the U.S. system are somewhat different than we experienced in Canada. The massive amounts of money previously available from clinical activity that drove the growth and the involvement of the academy in the healthcare delivery system has changed now. And because of payment systems, the insurance industry, the, the massive amounts of money previously available from clinical activity is decreasing rapidly. Indeed, although no major financial failures have occurred, to my knowledge, annual losses are being reported by some of these large centers. How this will eventually re be resolved is unclear to me, but I believe that prominent academic health science centers in the U.S., whether integrated under one ownership or based on affiliation agreements, will find ways to evolve and to continue. Given the status of the academic health science centers in North America, it may seem surprising that the UK have recently established six such organizations. In the UK model, universities with medical schools have been selected to form partnerships with NHS trusts, which operate hospitals. The stated goals of these academic health sciences centers, besides the integration of education, research, and clinical care, is to become international centers of excellence, able to compete in research and education. The partnerships are primarily based on agreements. Although the first one, developed at Imperial College London in 2007, was different. Initially, this was an arrangement between Imperial College and two NHS trusts, which agreed to create a new entity uh, with unified administration and governance. And indeed, for a time, one individual was the CEO of both the academic and the healthcare enterprise. During the economic recession, however, it became too difficult to separate and be accountable for the two streams of funding, and so administratively, the entities were separated. Since then, more NHS trusts have been uh, added to this organization, and the management is generally that of unlinked partners. The healthcare system in Canada also continues to evolve. Two provinces have now uh, uh, disbanded health regions to produce a single authority for the entire system. This in, in Alberta, this occurred in 2009, and since then, it, there has been a tumultuous time with too many CEOs in too short a period of time. During my tenure as a director of Alberta Health Services, I was always impressed with the potential uh, of this structure to strengthen the function of the academic health sciences centers through strong and meaningful partnerships with the university. It actually simplifies the administration of the, and, and governance of the healthcare delivery system. One particular initiative that was championed by the late Dr. Cy Frank was the creation of something he called strategic clinical networks. These networks focus on major health issues, such as vascular disease, as an example, and incorporate members of the academy, the healthcare system, and representatives of the community. It's too early to, ju to judge their, uh, their success, but if they do survive the many changes to management personnel, I believe that this will be a model 
that will help the academic health sciences centers in Alberta meet their intended potential. Another change in the Alberta landscape and elsewhere has been the creation of institutes. Some of these are responsible for integrating education, research, and patient care within a given discipline. Although many of these function very well, this is probably not a solution for the overall health system as the formation of multiple institutes would set, result in fragmentation when more unity is required. Perhaps the future success of the Canadian Academic Health Sciences Centre is through the development of networks, not only local, but provincial and national, as has been called for by a number of national organizations through the National Task Force. Of course, the formation of networks between Academic Health Sciences Centres will not alter the fact that they themselves are fragile organizational structures with each one having competing priorities, conflicting policies, multiple funding streams, and organizational disparity. In conclusion, academic health sciences centers have been and continue to be important to the tripartite mission of education, research, and clinical care in our health systems. There continues to be threats that these organizationally weak structures will fall victim to changing priorities of provincial governments, the healthcare system itself, or of the universities. However, I personally believe that the mission of the academic health sciences centers is too important for them to be allowed to fail. I know that's a dangerous position to take, but one that I think many would share. My personal view is that we should be bold and we should create a new and stable organizational structure at the provincial level to assure that these organizations can survive. A model is required that could be trialed in one province and transferred successfully to others. Perhaps this could be a suitable issue for the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences to address through a major assessment. Certainly, securing the future of academic health sciences centers would be a major contribution to the tripartite missions of education, research, and care. My anticipation is that Academic Health Sciences Center will survive and continue to contribute substantially to the health and welfare of our population. However, I'm not prepared to venture a guess as to what the organizational structure will look like in two decades. Again, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to deliver this lecture and to all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions or comments. Hi, Eldon. It's Chris Simpson from Kingston. I always appreciate uh, benefiting from your wisdom. Um, one of the roles I'm currently playing is the medical director of the Southeastern Ontario Academic Medical Organization, which is, I think, the first AFP in Canada. And uh, I've seen it sort of evolve from something that was quite idealistic through lots of problems. And now the wheel has almost come full circle because the accountability metric that's been introduced is basically fee-for-service billings. And so a lot of the behaviors that we were trying to get away from, clinical behaviors, are being reintroduced. So I'm wondering what you would think about um, uh, a, a, a pilot or a center that was brave enough to say, okay, because this isn't really about money, the money's allocated, physicians are being paid, this is really about just accountability. Uh, to devise a system where an academic health uh, network that was either regional or provincial would actually start to look at accountability metrics that were based on outcomes that are of interest to governments and uh, and uh, you know the good of the population as opposed to just clinical activity could could academic centers be the place where that could could get a foothold in Canada? Well, Chris, I think the answer to it is uh, possibly. Yes. Uh, there are lots of issues with that. I mean, to, uh, to take a, a service delivery model, which is what you have in, a, in an AFP, uh, such as SEMO, uh, as I, I think uh, to take on the issues of really looking at doing outcome research through that uh, mechanism, 
Uh, it certainly is possible, but it would be challenging. Obviously, the relationships with the university, you need more than the, that group of academic clinicians in order to do the kinds of research that are needed. And back to Alan's comments earlier, you really need contributions from all four pillars, not just the, the clinician-scientist uh, uh, contributions in order to, to answer those kinds of questions. So the answer is yes, I think it could work, uh, but I think it would have to be, uh, I think it would require an overarching organizational structure that had CIMO, uh, under it, as well as some healthcare institutions and some uh, parts of the academy that could help with the uh, questions being asked. Thank you for your comments. I'm Anita Molzan from the University of Alberta, and I think from your comments, I should be happy that I'm a dean of nursing and not a dean of medicine. But I wonder if you could comment a little bit on uh, the integration of nursing nursing education and research with clinical practice and perhaps other health sciences as well. Historically, we've been much more isolated. Uh, although we have partnerships with clinical practice, the funding structures don't encourage the kind of academic health sciences collaboration that exists within medicine. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, thank you for for the question. Uh, I just make the uh, the comment that maybe I told you more about the faculties of medicine than you wanted to hear. <laughs> um, on the on the surface, I think at times they look like uh, smoothly running operations that uh, there are no problems. But the truth is, is that these are very complex uh, organizational structures, and there are issues. I personally believe that uh, the issue that you address is, is one very important. I mean, I think that a lot of places have been trying, experimenting with integrated educational uh, systems. And uh, there, there's very, very pragmatic reasons why I think it hasn't worked better than it is. I do think that it's, it's, it's We've got to find ways to make it work uh, uh, more in, into the future, and, and particularly because we're expecting our students, whether they're coming from pharmacy, from nursing, or from medicine, we're expecting them to work in a team in the real world uh, once they graduate, and yet we're, we're training them in isolated uh, silos. And I think that's the wrong model to to stimulate the behavior that we're looking for in the future. So. Um, I don't have any magic answers for you. I don't have any uh, really good personal experiences that would, I would say, here's a model that can work. I do know that most places that I, where I talk to uh, individuals involved in the education, these things are being trialed and attempted, but I'm not aware of any really highly successful model at this point. One last question from Francoise. Yeah, I just uh, wondered if you might offer a comment I just wondered if you might offer a comment on the issue of academic freedom in this particular context, something that's extremely important to the academy and gets played out quite differently in certain health sciences centers. And just as a reminder, I'm from Nova Scotia and we recently had the decision in the Gabby Horn case. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that you ask tough questions. <laughs> I think uh, there. I, I can speak. I answer that question, I guess, from personal experiences, and say that I have been involved in a few issues that addressed academic uh, freedom issues from the academy point of view that were in conflict with the provision of clinical care, which is what uh, the academic clinicians, the clinician scientists that, we, that I'm talking about primarily this morning, uh, that, that they have an obligation within the healthcare system. I could give you an example. When I was dean of medicine, I had a grievance brought against me. Uh, because I failed to protect academic freedom of one of our, our uh, clinician scientists. And the claim went something like this, that this person was not being given appropriate time to pursue his research because his colleagues would not cover for him uh, in the call schedule. 
and they had concerns about his clinical ability, ability so refused on ethical grounds that were, would be supported by a regulatory college to say that they didn't need to cover his patients or the thing they were really worried about was having their patients covered by this person on evenings and weekends because they didn't think that that person had competence uh, sufficient for that. So, but, but this got involved in this whole question of academic freedom. And, and those get very, very difficult. I mean, you, you, you can take a decision that this, this is not a question of academic freedom, but there are conflicting forces at play. Uh, and, and I think that some of those are involved in the Gabby Horn and uh, some of the, uh, the Olivari uh, case in Toronto uh, a number of years ago. Uh, but uh, but uh, there there are conflicting constructs and conflicting uh, activities that come into play, make them very, very challenging. Well, it's clear that we could spend whole days on each of the topics that we've covered this morning. I want to thank again on your behalf uh, our last speaker, Eldon Smith, uh, for giving us an outstanding Paul Armstrong lecture. I think he's reviewed uh, the history and development of academic health science centers and the evolution of networks in a masterful way. And uh, we, we need, again, as uh, was alluded to this morning by Jocelyn, we need to look again in a couple of years. And this is a continuing unfolding saga, which uh, we will all be uh, watching with interest. Thank you so much.